Have you ever struggled to live out exactly what you believe and we're doing it without being a jerk? Over the next four weeks, some of our great pastors here at Pure Heart are gonna be tackling this issue, the issue of how do we look at living out our faith in this culture? And here's gonna be the hard part. We've all have to put aside our preconceived notions, our biases, our upbringings, and political platforms because we honestly really need to look and dig into what God tells us about this topic. Now, I believe if you watch through the entire service today with that heart attitude, you're going to leave with a deeper understanding and really some next steps to apply to your life. I'm Pastor Matt, the online campus pastor here at Pure Heart Church, and I know many times in my own life, living this out has felt like a struggle. My encouragement is this. After Pastor Bob shares, don't just log off and go about your day. We have a couple worship songs right after that message. And go ahead and do this. Use that time to seek God, reflect on, process on what living out these truths we're talking about today mean for your life. And maybe you thought before, eh, that singing part of the service is not really my thing. And look, hey, I get that. But if you lean in during that time, I think you're gonna leave with something good for your life. Now, couple quick things. First off, if you're new to our online community, welcome, welcome. We want you to head on over to pureheart.org slash online connect. Fill out a connect form. We want to get to know you. Also, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, click a like. Go ahead and share this video with a friend. Actually, sharing this video is a great first simple step doing what we're talking about today, impacting our culture. Another way is that if you've been a part of our online community for a little bit and you wanna make a difference, then during our live broadcast, we're looking for some friendly and welcoming greeters to engage. Say hi to our online community during these broadcasts. We also need loving people to pray with people's needs during these services, so important. If you think that's you, drop a comment in the chat or send us an email at online at pureheart.org. Also, if you have Kaiser offerings, which continue to support the mission of letting people know it's okay not to be okay, it's not okay to pretend, it's not okay to stay stuck, you can do that at pureheart.org slash give or in the Pure Heart app. Thank you, family, for your continued support of Pure Heart. And lastly, we're so blessed that over this last year, God has expanded this audience really in ways we never imagined. Thousands of people from all over the United States and the world have joined into our Pure Heart online family. And so over this summer, you're gonna be seeing some tweaks as we're making to continue to engage and grow people and families closer to Christ from all over the world. So some exciting stuff coming. One of those things that we've actually launched along with this service, we are now have our Heart Kids team releasing weekly church at home content for families with children. We have ones targeted at preschool audiences and grade school audiences because our desire is to equip you as parents to grow and lead your children in their faith. So cool. So you can watch them by searching Heart Kids on YouTube or following the link pureheart.org slash online campus. There's a link there also to those. Now I believe God has something good for your life today. So let's refocus, encourage our hearts, cast out fear and lies from our minds. All this, let's lean in, prepare our hearts to become more like Jesus for the sake of others. Welcome to church. So as a follower of Jesus, how do I go about living out what I believe in a culture that conflicts in so many ways with what I believe? Living out my beliefs without being a jerk, that's kind of what I want to talk about today. We've all known someone who's passionate about what they believe, but they also come across at times mean or insensitive or arrogant, unaccepting and uncaring. So if you're here, if you're watching in today online and you're not a follower of Jesus, you might be thinking, you know what, this is probably not going to be for me because I'm just at the beginning. I'm just here online to check all this stuff out. I'm not ready for something quite this intense. Well, listen, before you tune out, hang in there with me for just a minute. You may want to hear what I've got to say because a part of what I'm going to deal with today to start this whole series off, this whole conversation off is just to come right out and say, that we've not always done this the right way, especially when it comes to interacting with people whose beliefs are different than ours. There have been times when we've been everything but understanding, patient, caring, 
and full of the grace that we love to sing about in church. So I'm just going to come right out and acknowledge that for a people who claim to follow Jesus and say that we want our life to line up with him and to have our life be patterned after his, we've not always acted like him, sounded like him, or even based our beliefs on what's most important to him. There have been times when someone looking or listening in could have walked away thinking, man, if that's what Jesus is like, I don't know if I want to have anything to do with him. So this message is not about what you do or don't do. It's about how you come across to the people who don't share your beliefs. Truth is, isn't it, that we live in a diverse and complex culture with so many different viewpoints and opinions. It seems like everybody's got something to say. Everybody's got a point to prove. So with all the noise, conflict, increased hostility, what does God say about how he wants me to live out what I believe? You know, through the years, I've been able to observe some ways that followers of Jesus typically react to the culture around them. Some retreat. These are the people who isolate themselves. They just pull back and pull away from the culture around them. They don't know how to address it, so they become silent and absent. They don't want to be pulled into a fight. They don't want to be rejected or singled out or embarrassed, so they retreat. Here's the problem with avoidance. You can only run and hide from something for so long. Eventually, it's got to be dealt with. There are some who also who might choose to minimize. You know, it just it doesn't affect me. It's no big deal. What's going on in the world around me, it really doesn't have any implications on me directly. I can't do anything about it anyway. This kind of hits close to home for me. Several years ago, um, really, as I was beginning to be confronted with the issue of immigration and the lack of reform or the need for immigration reform in our country, God began to use a few people in a set of circumstances to confront my beliefs about immigration and the undocumented here in our country. Because it didn't directly affect me or anybody that I knew, I never really took the time to learn about the issues and the problems. I kind of took this position of, well, it's not my problem. And I'm not really sure it's really that much of a problem anyway. I mean, really, I mean, just go tell people to stand in line like everyone else who comes into our country. You see the minimization there? Thirdly, people sometimes just fight. So the more escalated things get, the more escalated they get. They just choose to fight. To these people, the solutions are found in things like power, intimidation, words, and generally, it's a lot of them. And ultimately, really what they have in mind is just to prove a point. So the louder the volume around them on an issue gets, the louder they get. The more forceful the argument gets, the harder they fight. Well, here's the danger with this one, my friends. If we're not careful, we can lose our perspective as followers of Jesus so that the point that we're trying to prove becomes more important than the person that we're called to honor and love. Now, most of us know that none of these really work very well, but we keep doing them because we don't really know how to do it any other way. It's how we've seen it done, and it's how we've done it most of our lives. So my friends, listen, Jesus calls us to a better way. Look at this verse with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, where the Apostle Paul writes, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Say that with me, ambassadors. It's as though God were making his appeal through us. I want to talk about that word ambassador for just a second. An ambassador is defined as a person who's the highest ranking diplomat sent as a representative from one nation to another. So the ambassador has one primary purpose and responsibility, right? To represent the king and his kingdom. The ambassador is singly focused on the king's mission, the king's values, and the king's agenda. An ambassador knows what the king thinks and wants. He or she is committed to that single cause, carrying out the will of the king. The ambassador works for the king. 
The king does not work for the ambassador. Now you could be thinking, what's that got to do with me? Well, the apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, these words. He writes, our citizenship is in heaven. What does that mean? Paul's saying that as a follower of Jesus, the Bible says you're from a heavenly nation. So it's as if God sends you as his highest ranking official representative to the culture around you to do what? To represent him and his kingdom. See, as an ambassador for Christ, what you think has to come under the authority of the king, your king, King Jesus. What you want, your desires, they have to come under the authority of what the king wants. His agenda becomes your agenda. Why? Because he's your king. The king does not adjust his agenda to you. Make no mistake about it. He doesn't customize what he wants around your preferences, your traditions, or even your comfort level. Wouldn't we like that if he did? Wouldn't we love it? It'd be a whole lot easier if the king would just consider our comfort level. If he would just give some thought and some consideration to my, my traditions and my preferences, but my friend, he does not. And he doesn't have to because he's the king. Our role is to adjust our preferences, our thoughts and our ideas and our agenda around his. So as an ambassador, it's our primary purpose and responsibility to, f to reflect our king's mission, his values and his agenda, to the culture around us, listen to this, in the same way that he would. In other words, we share his character. It's not just his agenda, but it's the way his agenda is presented. We follow in his character, that is, his gentleness, his patience, his peace, and ultimately, his love. Now, I gotta tell you, there have been times when I've showed up in a discussion or a debate, or even in a teaching that I was doing. And what I was teaching, what I was talking about was aligned with his mission and his values and his agenda. But I sure didn't sound very much like him. In fact, really what I was was more forceful, pushy, arrogant, and insensitive, and really more passionate about getting my point across than I was about the person that I was sitting across from or the people that maybe I was speaking to. So as we think about our beliefs and our reaction to things like politics, race relations, sexual orientation, taking care of our planet, all of these things that are going on around us in the culture around us, friends, we have to learn to think a little bit differently. So see, our starting point can't be, well, here's what I think, here's what I believe, here's what I want to see happen. We have to start, really, with a different way of thinking. It's a different approach. And that different way of thinking, that new starting point is, well, here's what my king thinks about it. Here's what my king says about it. Here's what my king wants to happen. Now, none of us are born with this viewpoint, are we? I mean, have you watched, have you seen a two or a three-year-old lately? They're really not about your agenda. They're not about your preferences. They kind of have their own, right? And they'll make that known to you. We have an opinion and we want to make it known. We have an agenda and we want to see it happen our way. We want what we want. And that's typically our general starting point. But friends, to be Christ's ambassador means you have to be willing to put your will aside for his will. Now, there's a word in the Bible for this kind of shift or change in the way that we think. It's the word repentance. And the word repentance means literally a change of mind that leads to a change in behavior. Listen, repentance is way more than saying, I'm sorry, God. Repentance is literally, I'm changing the way I think to line up with what God thinks, and then my actions are gonna follow from there. So before you offer your thoughts on a political position, or race relations, or sexual orientation, or taking care of our planet, you first would have to ask yourself, what does God think about it? That's a new way of thinking. That would be repentance, moving from what you think to what God thinks, a new way of thinking. And listen, if you're not, if you don't know yet, if you're not familiar enough with scripture, if you're not familiar enough with Jesus's way, and you don't know yet, you don't really know what God's position would be on something, then commit yourself to finding out as best you can what he does say about it. 
what he does think about it. And in the meantime, listen, don't offer an opinion. Maybe just keep quiet until you get it a little bit more fleshed out and sorted through. You know, it's really okay to say to someone when you're asked about your opinion over an issue, it's okay for you to say, you know, I don't really know yet. I'm, I'm working that out. See, I'm learning to follow Jesus and I'm really not yet sure what he says about that, but I am working on it. I'll get back to you. Now, why is this so important to God? Well, look at the last part of verse 20 with me again. Let's read this. It's as though God were making his appeal through us. Who's us? I'll tell you who us is. You're us and I'm us. You could really read the verse this way. It's as though God were making his appeal through me. What's God's appeal? In order to understand God's appeal, the appeal that God is making to the world around us, you got to look back at what Paul writes in verses 17, 18, and 19. Here they are. Let's look at them. Paul writes, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Isn't that great news? And he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. The Amplified goes on to say, so that by our example, we might bring others to him. The definition of reconciliation, it can be defined as this. It's to bring into agreement or harmony. It's to make compatible or to restore. Reconciliation, it's the mission of our King. So really, Jesus has a message that he wants delivered and he has a mission that he wants carried out. Let's look at the message that he wants delivered. He reconciled us to himself through Christ. Folks, that's his message. You're to be a carrier of that message. Paul is saying, He's saying here that our message to the world around us is really twofold. There's a new you that can replace the old you. That's when he said, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation and the old is gone and the new is here. What an amazing message. Friends, your life is filled with, your family is filled with people. The world around you is filled with people who need that message. The hope of the reality that the old person that they represent, the old person they are, can be replaced by a whole new amazing person that God wants to recreate in them. Secondly, the message is, I'm for you. Paul says, not counting people's sins against them. Wow, that's incredible news. God is saying, I'm for you. The world around us needs to know that, my friends. The world needs this message. They need to know the understanding that God is for them, not against them. He's not looking for ways to punish them and keep them out of a relationship with him or keep them out of heaven. God is saying, I'm for you. Listen, that's the message of our king. And it must be the message of those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus. Look at this in Luke chapter 8 verse 1. Luke the writer wants us to know that Jesus was all about this friends. Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another proclaiming what? The good news of the kingdom of God. Listen folks, the message of Jesus is good news. So listen, you have a choice. You can either walk around looking for ways to argue and fight with the people around you to make your point and to get across what you believe, or you can walk around looking for ways to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Now listen, I know this is not easy for us, and I certainly don't always get this perfectly myself, but I can tell you a time when it really, really showed up in my own life, and it really produced some amazing kingdom fruit that I think represents the kind of fruitfulness that God wants all of us to have. So I told you earlier that God had used a set of uh, circumstances and some people in my life to begin to confront some of my beliefs about immigration and the need for immigration reform. That led to multiple trips, like six, seven trips to Washington, D.C., where myself and a small team of people began to advocate for immigration reform. So we were meeting with 
senators and congressmen and congresswomen and other leaders in Washington, D.C., hoping to really begin to advance the message and the need for immigration reform. I got to tell you, our first two trips to Washington, D.C., as we were knocking on the doors of senators and congressmen and congresswomen, they were really frustrating and fruitless for the most part. Like we weren't getting anywhere. So we decided to change our approach a little bit for the subsequent trips. We would show up at the door of a senator, most of the time we would have an appointment, or some of their staff members, because sometimes they weren't available, we couldn't get an appointment with them, but we would meet with the members of their staff. And we started to shift our approach to show up and say, listen, hey, I know that previously when we've come here, you know, we've had an agenda. We're kind of like all the other people who are outside your door right now, line up the hallway who are lobbyists and they've got a point to make. And man, and we say, you know what? We're calling the time on that. We're not here to do that. We're really not. We're here to check on you. We'd like to know how you're doing. We know that you have a really demanding job. We know you have your hands full. We know that you're trying to you know, do the best for people and what's right and best across our nation. We really do believe that. And we believe that you've got a lot of challenges and that's gotta be super, super frustrating and amazingly hard for you. And the truth of the matter is, I don't really know how you continue to find the strength to do what you do. So here's what, here's what we came here for. We came here to check on you. We came here to see how you're doing. How's your family doing? How can we pray for you? And you know the reaction that we got from these leaders and these amazing people sitting across the table from us was unbelievable. First of all, we got this kind of look of disbelief, like, what? What did you just ask me? And then as we moved forward further into that conversation with them, oftentimes we'd see tears. It was having an impact. God was moving and stirring in their hearts and their lives. And we would ask for very specific ways that we could pray for these men and women. And we saw the kingdom advanced in their lives and in that moment in ways that we hadn't seen in the previous two trips when we had a point to prove. As his ambassadors, we have the ability to bring people back together and back to God. Come a little closer. But my question is simply this. How can we be saying to a world around us, come a little closer, and at the same time, knowingly, sometimes unknowingly, be pushing people away with our opinions, positions, and attitudes that don't reflect the Jesus that we say we follow. Friends, Jesus is alive inside you. That means that he's drawing people to himself through you. Don't get in the way of that. Don't get in his way. He wants you to participate in that. I remember um, several years ago, I received when I was pastoring a church on 27th Avenue between Glendale and Northern. Now, to those of you that are watching online, you're not from the Phoenix area, you're not familiar with our neighborhoods necessarily, you really have no idea uh, what that even means. But basically, I was pastoring a church for 21 years that was in a very challenged and under-resourced area. And I had learned um, that because I got, in the, I got a letter in the mail uh, one day uh, from a group of people that I didn't even recognize. It was a letter from the Islamic Community Center of Phoenix, which was literally located two blocks away from my church. I had no idea they were even there. And the letter was outlining some struggles they were having with the city of Phoenix over some zoning issues that they were having with parking. And the city was saying that they could no longer have their people park out on the streets, hundreds of people who were coming for Friday prayers, and they could no longer do that. The neighbors were in uproar and complaining about all the cars and all the traffic in the neighborhood. And so the letter was an appeal for me to consider renting them parking spaces on Friday so that their people would have a place to come and park, go to church, and pray. I looked at this letter and I thought, I, I don't know who these people even are. So I called one of the young leaders in my church who I knew had been working with uh, Islamic relations in other parts of the world. And I asked him if he had ever heard of the Islamic Community Center Phoenix. And he kind of laughed. He was a young leader. He kind of laughed and said, well, yeah, actually, they're the, like the largest mosque in the Southwest. And I'm like, wow, how in the world could I not even know these people existed? And so I, I said, do you know anybody there? He said, well, I know a few people. I asked him if he could set up a meeting. 
with some of their leaders, myself, and if he would mind joining me. He set the meeting up. We walked in, there was a little circle of uh, probably five of them and myself and my friend, one of the members of my church and one of the leaders of my church. And we removed our shoes and walked in and did some real brief introductions together. And these were the top tier leaders of their Islamic community center. And they looked at me and said, Pastor, why are you here today? And I held up the letter and I said, here's why I'm here. I'm here for two reasons. Number one, I, I want to ask your forgiveness for something. They kind of looked at me I'm like, what? I said, yeah, I, I'd like to ask your forgiveness for being a lousy neighbor. I had no idea you guys were even in the neighborhood. No idea you were even here. And the truth is, I really have been in a lousy neighbor and not knowing anything about you. I came to ask for your forgiveness. That Will you forgive me? And they looked around the room at each other like, what, what? And they kind of smiled and said, well, sure, we'll forgive you. And I said, thank you. Secondly, as I continued to hold up that letter that I received in the mail, I said, I want to address a request that you're making here in this letter. You're asking me if you can rent, if I'm understanding correctly, if you can rent parking spaces that I have available in my parking lot so that your people can have a place to come and park so that they can go and pray for an hour on Friday. Is that correct? And they said, yes. And I said, well, have you seen my parking lot on Fridays lately? Because I have like 200 parking spaces and currently we use about like 25 of them, maybe 30 at the most on a Friday. So I have tons of parking available. So you know that, right? Yes. And I said, what makes you think that I would rent you parking spaces so that your people could come and pray? And I said, because I'm not going to do that. If you want to ask me, can you come, can you use parking spaces? Absolutely. You can have as many parking spaces as you want. You know, it was amazing to me how that conversation continued to roll and turn. Because then I said to them, and here, you know, there's one more thing I'd like to kind of ask you while I'm here, while we're together in this circle of friendship here. I'd like to just, I've been thinking about this. Does it, I asked them a couple questions. Does it bother you that tonight, X number of children, and I gave them the number, X number of children in our neighborhoods are going to bed tonight and they'll feel the pain of hunger in their stomachs. I said, yeah, they looked at each other, yeah, of course that bothers us. I said, you know what? It really bothers me too. Does it bother you that X number of people in our community, in our neighborhoods are without work? And I had that number, I was able to give it to them, at least an approximate number. X number of people are without work. They're living in, in, in poverty type circumstances and situations. And I went through several different questions and they affirmed that they shared the same level of discomfort and the same level of concern that I did. So here's what I proposed to them. I suggested maybe that we put aside our differences because I said, look, you're not gonna change the way I think about some of these things when it relates to our spirituality and I'm not gonna change the way you think. So why don't we just push those things aside for a few minutes, maybe for a few days, maybe for a few weeks, maybe even for longer. And what if we focus on the things that we agree on together? And do you know, from that conversation forward, we started doing some amazing things together. They would come over uh, to our church on Sunday mornings, a team, uh, from the Islamic Community Center, if you can picture this. Because we were, we had a breakfast on Sunday mornings where we'd feed about 200 children and families from the neighborhood that we referred to, that were referred to us through the school social workers in our area. And they were invited with a special certificate that would invite them to a hot breakfast on a Sunday morning. And our friends, our brothers and sisters from the Islamic Community Center would serve breakfast shoulder to shoulder with followers of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? See, I think that's the kind of thing Jesus wants us to focus on. I think that's the kind of thing he wants to invite us into. As ambassadors of Christ, my friends, we have something more. We're called to something higher than proving a point and making a point. We're called to more than just fighting our culture. Jesus invites us to join him and sharing in his message and his mission. We're called to be reconcilers. We're called to be people who bring people and God back together. And I believe that God has equipped us with everything we need to do that in an amazing and beautiful way that really reflects the beauty of heaven itself. So I know some of you are hearing this story and you're thinking, wow, that's, um, 
that makes me feel really uncomfortable. You know, I mean, like, how do I, as a follower of Jesus, like, interact with Muslims? I mean, that's like, that can be challenging for some of you who are maybe listening in to this. And I understand that. I realize that for a long time, it was very uncomfortable for me as well. But as I look more and more at the footsteps of Jesus, and as I follow his life and his examples and his teaching through scripture, you know, he did not isolate himself. He did not insulate himself from the people in the culture and in the world around him who shared beliefs that were different than his. In fact, he pursued those people. He was open to those people. He welcomed those people. You know, it's interesting to note that some of the very harshest words that Jesus had for people in his day, they were not the people who didn't think like him necessarily or believe like him. They were aimed at the religious rulers and teachers of his day who were closed-minded and who, had, who wanted nothing to do with people who didn't align with them. To the rest of the world, Jesus' words were mostly engaging and invitational. Come a little closer, he said over and over and over again. Now listen, I know that, again, this, this comes with a little bit of a cost because uh, I, I remember some of the events following our work with the Islamic Community Center and the relationship that we started to build with them. One day I remember when we were doing these breakfasts together, we were hosting them at our campus because we had a large dining area and a very large commercial kitchen that was located in the lower level of our church. We had a three level building that was our main building. And so one day this lady comes up out of the lower level, she gets off the elevator onto the second level, which was, um, which was our welcome center and our lobby. And I was on the second level and I could see her. She stood out to me right away as she came off the elevator and she's coming down this long, uh, uh, long lobby area. And I could recognize her. She stood out because she was obviously annoyed. Like she was irritated with a capital I and she was looking for me. She interrupted a conversation that I was in and she said, Pastor, do you know that right now there are there are Muslims down in our basement. I looked at her and smiled and said, actually I do because I invited them. And she turned without saying a word and she made a beeline down that long lobby and out those doors and I never saw her again. And tragically over subsequent weeks, many other people followed her. In fact, it was one of the things that probably led to a second church split, if you will, in our congregation, because it is uncomfortable. I'm not here to say one group was right and one group was wrong. There's a little bit of right and wrong and all of that, both parties, if you will. What I am here to acknowledge is that it's not the easy way. The things that I'm talking to you about today, be an ambassador of Christ, and delivering his message and carrying out his mission, it's not always easy and it's not always going to be comfortable. The truth of the matter is, at times, it's going to be messy and it will come with some sacrifice and it will come with some cost. Jesus doesn't call us to a messy, free way of life. He calls us to a beautiful and fruitful kingdom way of life. And in the end, that's always the most satisfying way. And that's what you're called to. You're called to be an ambassador and a representative of the king, to carry his mission, to carry his values, and to carry his agenda. So here we come to the end of our time together today. And I, I wanna talk to, for just a minute, I wanna talk to the person uh, who's listening in, who would like to begin a relationship with Jesus. Like you'd like to start to follow him. You've heard him say today, come a little closer. And you're like, well, that's intriguing to me. Like, I'd like to, little, I'd like to know a little bit more about what that means to like come a little closer and to experience him in a little closer, maybe deeper, deeper, more meaningful and satisfying way. If that's you today, I wanna to invite you just to bow your head, wherever you are, wherever you're listening, just bow your head and whisper this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, thank you 
for talking to me today. Thank you for whispering into my heart these words come a little closer. And that's my desire today, Jesus. I really do want to come a little closer. So I want to receive you into my life and my heart today. I don't have all the answers to the questions that I have, but I have enough to know that I believe that you're here right now in this space, in this place, and you're inviting me in to a relationship with you. So I want to receive you into my life and into my heart. I want to confess my need for you. I want to confess that my ways have not been the best ways. I want to confess my sin to you, the very things that have gotten in the way of my relationship with you. I want to acknowledge those things to you today. I want to receive you into my life as the new leader of my life and as the forgiver of all my sins. Help me, Jesus, to begin to learn what it means to live out a relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing and answering my prayer today. Amen. Now, to those of you who are followers of Jesus and you've been listening in, I want to invite you just to spend a couple of minutes today or even throughout the week reflecting on a couple of questions just out of what we've talked about today. First question I want you to reflect on is really seriously, who's your king? Like really, who's your king? Who do you pattern your life after? Do you align your beliefs and positions around what Jesus teaches. I mean, think about that. As you think about all the hot issues in culture today, and you think about your opinions and your beliefs and your position and your stance, how do they line up with what Jesus taught, with what Jesus modeled, the example that he left us to follow? Would you think about that this week? I mean, really give it some thought. And then lastly, how are you perceived by the people around you who don't believe what you believe. What do you think you sound like to them? Do you sound anything at all like Jesus? Do you reflect his character, his nature of grace and patience and acceptance, peace and love? Think about those things this week. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your amazing word. Thank you, God, for inviting us into this space of not only living with you, but living out what we believe in a world around us that you are passionate about redeeming. You're passionate about reconciling. God, thank you for entrusting into our care this ministry of reconciliation that we've learned about today, that we've been talking about. God, I pray that we would steward that wisely and well, that we would take it seriously that we would think about it today and that we would invite you into those spaces of our life, God, where we need to be renewed or empowered in some way to represent you in the ways that are more pleasing and most honoring to you. And Father, we look forward to the fruit of your kingdom that we will see in our lives as we follow you and live this out. We pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, wherever you're at, would you just worship with us? Let's worship our God because he's worthy of our praise.
never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let. Hold on, let's lift it up. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. No. Everything, oh 
Jesus Christ, you are my one desire. Lord, hear my only cry to know you all my life. Oh, your love so deep is washing over me. Your wound is all I seek. You are my everything. Jesus. service today, we talked about living out our faith in culture. And we as a church want to be doing the right things for the right reasons for the sake of others. Our Life Bridge at Pure Heart Resource Center team this year, they leaned into so many needs and challenges during COVID. They faced triaging things for families were facing over all those months. And in doing so, they had many other resources and services that they had to put on hold. And they're in the process now of training volunteers and relaunching those over the next few weeks. Now, one of those ones that they're relaunching is our GED program. Now, the heartbreaking fact is that out of 10 adults over 25 years old, one out of 10 of those adults does not have a high school diploma. There's many reasons why an individual never would graduate from high school, but in doing so, it sets them up for a life of limited employment opportunities and usually a reliance on social services. So we'll have coaches that'll be walking alongside these people in our resource center to help tutor, encourage, build report, and help these individuals see their value. We're also gonna connect them to financial resources to help cover the cost of GED tests, help find childcare. Finances and no child care are actually some of the biggest hurdles that stand in the way of people getting that diploma. As more people enroll, we're gonna be expanding the classes to multiple times and days during the week. What a cool thing to be a part of, giving opportunities to help lift people from poverty, their reliance on social services, giving them the confidence in themselves, all while showing them the love of Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we as a church, we thank you for all the things you let us do over this last year, God. We thank you that we are able to relaunch new things, that as people are, are stable, their lives are becoming more stable, 
but they still have great, great need, Heavenly Father. And so uh, we thank you for the things we're able to do, but we believe that there are many, many things you're called us to as a church, ways that we can help those, the working poor, those that are struggling, Heavenly Father, and that we can help lift them out of the things and the challenges in their lives, God. We pray that right now you're going to let each person that is enrolling in that, Heavenly Father, give them uh, a heart and a desire Give them wisdom, give them strength and encouragement to their mind as they go through. God, and we thank you for each and every person giving. We pray for that you would bless the tithes and offerings that are coming in and of those finances that are help support things like this that Pure Hearts do. In the name of Jesus, amen. So, as you put your tithes and offerings in the mail, as you're giving online, texting to give, or giving in the Pure Heart app, please know that these are the types of things your faithfulness is going to support. Thank you, family, for your continued support of Pure Heart and the ministries that we get to partner with and the ways we get to impact people as God's expanding our reach across the nation and the world and letting us stand in the gaps and be the hands and feet of Christ. So be encouraged, have an amazing week, and keep your focus on Him as we continue to love like Christ for the sake of others in new and exciting ways. And we'll see you next week.